So my topic tonight is to let's build the next level MCOM operator. And uh, I'm ready, Dan. Uh, the um, my goal is to uh, make provide a framework for how doesn't matter who the MCOM operator is working for, whether it's a, a served agency, a part of the government, or or the Red Cross, or or a bike race, or whoever. This is going to be the way that, uh, and it's a proven way that we can satisfy whatever served agency those are working for. Now, this is the executive summary. I want to get this slide in first in case you nod off during the rest of the slides. This is the way we're going to go about it. The first thing you do is you ascertain what skills and technologies the AHJs, the authorities having jurisdictions, or the served agency, and I'm going to say AHJ as opposed to serve agency tonight. We're going to uh, find out what skills the AHJs want or need uh, so that they consider the ham radio operators to be trusted volunteers in missions. And then once we learn that, what we do is provide the training necessary to fulfill those needs, uh, whatever skills it is, whether it's digital stuff, whether they need uh, people to shadow an individual, uh, whether they need somebody that can work CW or whether they need somebody to empty the trash cans, whatever it is, we provide the training necessary to fulfill those needs. And then after we've got the people trained, what we do is provide exercises uh, to find, um, and we, we don't do exercises to point out faults. What we look for are opportunities for improvement. And uh, then once we identify those opportunities for improvement, we provide training to fill gaps and improve the outcomes. And then <clears throat> just like when you were washing your head with shampoo, whenever the last time was, you lather, rinse, and repeat because that's what it says on the bottle. Okay, Dan. Now, there's just a little bit of history. I am going to have to put my glasses on because I can't read without them. Back in the good old days, um, and I'm old enough to remember this, uh, so systems fail without a quick repair option or redundancy. Back in the very earliest time that I was involved in public safety communications, if a radio broke, it stayed broke until you could take it back to the shop. There wasn't any such thing about switching uh, over to another system or anything else. And back in those days, hams worked in a loose volunteer model. They may have been trained. They maybe weren't. They may have uh, had a background check. They might have not been. Uh, they brought their own radios to the uh, incident or to the command post, whatever, whatever the deal was. And a lot of them thought this, especially when portable radios came out, if they had a radio, they were in charge because they could they could uh, tell people what to do. And that caused a lot of hurt feelings on both sides because neither side had clear expectations of what the other side was doing or wanted. And that that's been our problem for a, quite a while. I can remember several instances where hams would show up, new hams, that thought that they were in charge because they had a Chinese radio. Okay, Dan. <clears throat> so time marches on and we have changed. The world moves. Uh, 1988, the Stafford Act uh, occurred and the Stafford Act is what pays for disasters, pays for your emergency manager in your counties, all kinds of stuff. And uh, it uh, uh, put some educational requirements on everybody that's in that organization that a lot of hams found burdensome. They didn't want to take those ICS classes because after all, all they're going to do is talk on the radio. And so I, my idea is I don't want to be the person that causes a problem. And one of the problems that actually does occur in is that uh, your funding stream can be interrupted if you've had a disaster. If you, if uh, the emergency manager of the county judge who, or, or administrator, whatever it is, uh, is not able to sign a piece of paper that they make him sign to, to receive a reimbursement check, that all 
people involved were NIMS compliant. And that uh, I, I know of a county here, here in Arkansas that got a warning and their money was uh, held for a significant period of time. Now, they ended up paying them because our governor at the time made a pretty good little I don't know what he did for sure, but he begged, I think, and uh, they released the money. So uh, in any case, I don't want to be the cause of that particular problem. And I don't think anybody else does once they're thinking about it. Okay, Dan. <clears throat> so the next thing that went on was that the um, equipment that the, the AHJs had became a lot better. Uh, stuff became uh, more resilient more uh often more redundant and was uh especially more robust their their circuits were and what have you and besides that a lot of the vendors that sold them that stuff told them it wasn't going to break and said there's just no way that this is going to uh break but that's uh as we all know that's not exactly true and you know the given the difference of an authority having jurisdiction of having enough money to buy a redundant system or something that they, they were told was uh, robust, why would they put up with a bunch of ham radio operators that didn't do anything but just give them grief all day long? And uh, I can very easily uh, point to two or three different instances that I'm aware of in different states where that is exactly what has happened. Next slide, please. So uh, what's going on now is because things we're still uh, changing, what th things are moving on here, there are bad actors in the world that uh, give us a little deliberate sabotage. I talked to um, a fellow in uh, California last night that had, uh, they'd implemented some software that on their P25, 700, 800 trunk system, they are listening to not only the microwave, but the carrier channels as well, uh, the uh, control channels rather. They're listening for carriers that would be deliberate interference or jamming. And uh, that's that was uh, something that we're not doing here in Arkansas yet, but I, I brought that up today and our, our uh, project manager for, for our system here says, huh, <laughs> we've never thought of that. We're our, our hair is just a little bit on fire here in Arkansas because of the April 2024 eclipse. And we're seriously concerned about uh, people doing some jamming, whether it's on our uh, statewide system or even ham radios. I, that's a, that's something that we've um, we're beginning to think about. Disruptions can occur, can be um, anything from a, a thunderstorm. Uh, for instance, uh, yesterday, we had 15 minutes worth of baseball size hail here at my house. Um, there's been several different sites uh, of our public safety system here in Arkansas that were hit by that stuff. And we've got some antenna damage and some degradation of uh, microwave paths that they're, gonna, that they're out looking for right now. And they've called for help from uh, wherever it is Motorola gets help from. And that's, uh, that's going to go on. Now, so far, we haven't had any failures. It's just been a great degradation of service. And so um, that thing, we know that that can happen, even with these very robust, very resilient, very expensive systems. Next slide, please. So what we work with uh, in, in modern emergency management then is uh, the PACE communications plan, primary, alternate, contingency and then alternate and the idea is is that uh, the primary of course uh, for those of you that don't know your primary is what you work on on a day-to-day -day basis that's what you always use whether it's your cell phone uh, your uh, radio system your what, whatever whatever it is whether no matter what it is that's your primary system and then your alternate is what you go to if that fails and your contingency is what that goes to. And then uh, the alternate, of course, is uh, where ham radio fits in quite nicely. And there's a bunch of people that do want to volunteer and use their skills and technology to, to aid in relief and continuity operations. And those are the guys that we can train. Uh, we can help get trained to the AHJ's satisfaction. Where our real challenge is, 
is doing away with the prejudices that have occurred in the, in the last um, 40 years since the Stafford Act uh, became law and melding those hams and the AHJs is our big biggest problem. That's what I see in any case. That's what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the way that I think that we want to go about this is that uh, we have to, uh, going back to that too long, didn't read slide. We want to identify uh, AHJs that will, that will talk to us in an inf information gathering event. And we will identify uh, inexperienced, just hams that are interested in MCOM to participate in, a, in this same event. We uh, develop questions for both groups and we get answers from both groups and then we make a lesson plan. But what we learned from the AHJs is what it is that they want um, the hams to be able to do. We learn from the hams what it is they can already do and are proficient in. And then we develop a lesson plan to make them proficient in the other skills that the AHJs find to be necessary or good to have, whatever it is. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So continuing on with that, uh, we, we would deliver or cause to be delivered the curriculum that's defined by the lesson plan. Then we evaluate uh, the, or then we do an exercise to evaluate how well we uh, built the curriculum. Then we do an exercise that will identify the, the gaps and shortfalls and see where we need to adjust that curriculum. And then we can adjust uh, deliver the adjusted curriculum and then we lather rinse and repeat until everybody is satisfied whether it's the hams that uh, have chosen to participate or if it's the ahjs that are in fact investing in the ham radio operators because it's generally them or uh, that are that's providing training that what they think is necessary um, as well as the equipment that they would have to buy that would uh, fulfill that mission. Next slide. And so, yeah, well, golly, JM, that's a lot to do. And the, the, that's exactly right. That is a lot to do. Uh, but when we get that done, we can celebrate and enjoy our students' suggest, uh, successes. Um, and the, the address there is the sample groups inside is demographics will have to be determined. I should have put that on the last slide, but I didn't, I forgot. So here it is. And, um, uh, Dan, I think that, uh, that comes to the next slide, which is talking question time. And I am ready, uh, for suggestions and, uh, Tell me what you think and tell me how you're going to implement this or, or ask for it to be implemented in your areas. Don't all talk at once. Well, it'd be helpful if I had my microphone, everything unmuted here. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you want to speak, put uh, questions in the chat, and uh, we'll go from there. Barry, what do you got in chat? One comment from Tom, he says, a way to endear yourself to the host AHJ is to fill out the personnel accountability and make sure that it makes it to the timekeeper or accounting people. And how do we deal with those that demand to participate but push back hard on the training requirements? So the people that don't want to do the training requirements, I've got uh, the answer to that is we'll find them something else to do. It's um, what we're doing with those guys uh, uh, here in Arkansas, for instance, we've got a bunch of folks that are uh, very interested in helping, but they don't have a ham radio license. They're doing the GMRS and uh, I value their, their help to no end. And what they can do for us is situational awareness. We can put them somewhere, uh, you know, as long as they're trusted by the AHJ. And that's, that's who's making this determination. It's not me. It's not Dan Marler, and it's not Steve Waterman. Nobody, none of us are making the determination that they can participate or not. 
The idea is that they have to satisfy whatever AHJ that they want to volunteer for. When they can satisfy them, then they can participate. Otherwise, they they can just stay home. I don't know what, I, you know, uh, we're sorry that we can't use you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Not everybody gets employed, and that's just the way that it is. The key that's is the way of the world. He is to find and convince the various cities, towns, organizations to want to have ham radio assistance. I'm finding that many of them don't really understand that ham radio exists. It doesn't cost them any money. It can get them a lot of federal funds. We had we had a town that did an did a an exercise, and they didn't have a ham radio station set up. And FEMA came down and said, well, you don't meet our requirements. You're not getting any federal money. And they said, what do you mean? We'll have to get ham radio going. And so now they have a very active ham radio group. We need to make the groups that need us aware that we're there. And it doesn't cost them any money to do it. I I agree with that. I agree with that, Barry. And that's something that we've done from a state level and pass that down to the county level is that uh, we are very active in uh, making sure that new uh, coordinators understand that there's requirements that they have to fulfill in order to qualify for all that money. And that's what all this boils down to is money, believe it or not. Who's next? Dan, you want to handle the questions? Yeah, go ahead. Don, if anybody knows the other side of the world, it's you. Take the floor, sir. You're talking to me, Dan? Yeah, I am. I am. Okay, well, Dan, you know my history. You know, a lot of people don't know I'm an emergency manager, have been for 18 years but I'm also a ham operator for 30 years. And what I've learned over the years is example, success brings more success. And I'll use a, an example also. We did an exercise in, in our area for the whole state and it was not, it was force fed to the emergency managers, but being an emergency manager, I was able to do that. And by doing that, it showed success. Now they're begging for more information. They're begging success will breed people coming to us. I do have a hard time. We did the Cascadia Rising exercises, brought hams in, and didn't know what to do. So proper training is necessary. Being a FEMA instructor, all this uh, Stanford Act and all these ICS courses and COMEL and COMT, they're begging for things to do, but nobody's showing them what they can do. And I think you get a spark in an area, grab that spark, run with it, blow on it, and add more fuel, and you will have success by example. That's my two cents. So, Dan, you're, you're preaching to the choir here for sure. <laughs> I think uh, that uh, won't, won't be anybody argue with you the, about uh, what you said. The, uh, I wish that this presentation or this type of presentation and what you said could be shown to every emergency manager in the, in the country. Who's next? Okay. Dan, WL7CO. Oh, he's finally got his voice back. Go ahead, Dan. There you go. Uh, JM. So I, uh, I'm referring back to the, I think it was five bars of uh, the, the schema you were going to use to bring the amateur radio service and emergency management agencies agencies onto the same frame of reference. And my only thought was, it'd be nice if things were that discreetly divided, but there's a continuum in both parties, emergency managers and the amateur radio service of both of, of competency and skill sets and willingness to work as part of a team. So, you know, I think, Anything that can quickly affect team building, no matter how it happens, where the trust can get started, is a primary focus. And another comment is listening to lectures by FEMA and CISA, basically about the exact same topics, we hear different sets of acronyms and stories about how it's all happening. So... That's just something for the government side to think about. I agree with you 100%, uh, Dan. One of the things that I'm uh, very involved in is the instruction. And so I get to design the curriculum here uh, in Arkansas with uh, using the other instructors that are 
employed at the Arkansas Division of Emergency Management. One of the things that we do is think about, uh, we talk to the uh, emergency managers, we talk to the trained state training officer, and we talk to the um, people that are at, uh, boots on the ground folks and ask them what it is that we need to be showing our ham radio operators, what it is that they need to be doing to make everybody's else, everybody else's job easier as well as maybe even replace some of them, for instance, in a dispatch center so that they could go do something more important. I, and that's not the exact, that's not the best word, but you know what I'm trying to say, I bet. And here productive. We're, yeah. Most productive. Most, most, yeah important, productive. most important person in a base camp are the people that clean the toilets. That's exactly right. Yep. We, uh, we're we <laughs> on the same sheet of music right there. Okay. That sounds good. Thanks, Dan. Um, let's jump over to the text for a little bit. Uh, Barry, how are we doing? Mr. Barry, Mr. Barry. Mostly, mostly all comments, uh, no questions, but there are some good comments. I mean, FEMA now recognizes that we used to work in the ICS system. We need to preach this to the local groups because all disasters are local. And for example, we have a event that was supposed to be done this weekend by a little town that's a mile and a quarter square. We've never trained with them. We've never worked with them but they're gonna have an event that's gonna have 5,000 people come into this little mile and a quarter square. We said that we were willing to help and we, but they said, no, you cannot help. We do not need, we do not need you. So we said, okay, so we won't help. But next time, if you want us, we, we're willing to train with you. And they said, no, we're not willing to train with you. We can handle this all by ourselves. So FEMA has to go to the, all these little tiny towns and hamlets and stuff and say, hey, if you want your money, you're going to have to employ the hands. And it doesn't matter if it's Aries or, or Racy's or part of uh, the sister groups and uh, stuff like that. GMRS too. We all have to work together and we all have to train together. And uh, that's what we need to do. And FEMA has presented three webinars promoting the use of amateur radio. And there's a link in there from Pete. And that's all. There's anything in the chat. So one of the things that's happened here in the last month is that uh, ARRL got invited to join SAFECOM, which is the CESA advisory group. Set, we help, uh, SAFECOM helps set policies uh, that are utilized uh, by FEMA, as a matter of fact. And uh, SAFECOM was instrumental in, in uh, getting the changes done in the incident command system so that OXCOM was recognized uh, and actually named, uh, and, there, and there's going to be some new positions uh, that have to have their training developed, as a matter of fact. One of them is the um, AUX-C, which is the auxiliary uh, coordinator. Um, th he's, that's one. Um, and the COM-C, which is a communications coordinator, is another one. So uh, I'm uh, I'm very much looking forward to those curriculums and and uh, continuing my education with those. Who's next? Okay, Gene. Looks like you're up. Okay, everybody. This is Gene from uh, Clean Texas in 3X US. Uh, my question is: Is Aries has their own task book? Oxcom has their task book. Lacey's has somewhat of a test book, but not really. But you, know, you pretty much know what they expect of you based upon the regions and districts. Could it be that the third agencies, whether it be private agencies, local governments, might be aware of all these organizations, but they're seeing different uh, qualifications in order to be a part of them and provide uh, ham radio communications. Should there be just one amateur radio program that provides qualified amateur radio operators to be involved in MCOM so that those credentials will be like the, uh, the, the measuring stick 
on whether they can be effective in whatever the case might be? So that's a that's a very that's a good question, uh, but it's a little bit complicated, uh, Gene. And what I'm going to have to tell you is right this minute that um, you can think of amateur radio as, as varied as it is, and you know very well that there's a, anything that you want to do in ham radio, there's a place for you. And uh, when it comes to the different groups that have those different task books, I think that uh, it goes back to the, uh, the idea that we have to satisfy the AHJ. If they're happy with what uh, the ARRL says, then fine. If they're not, and they would like some other skills to, to go along with that, then that's what we need to teach. If the, um, if the skills are, uh, if they're just happy with you having a license <laughs> and having gone to the Oxcom class, which is, you know, there's some qualifications, prerequisites to go to that, then that's, that's their choice. And that's what we should do. I agree that, that there has been some talk about, um, uh, typing, in other words, uh, a tiered system, a type one fire truck is different than a type three. And, uh, that's, that's just something that is, is, um, going, going on and on, uh, down the road. That's so far down the road right now that I'm not willing to think about it too much. Uh, if they, if they said, okay, JM, we're ready to start developing that stuff. We want you to work on it. I'd surely jump in with both feet, but as it is, I think that we have to build enough trust at a local level. We've got trust at a, at a national level. Now I can tell you that but we do not have trust at local levels. And until we have that, a tiered system is not really what we want to do. When we do get that tiered system going on, then we'll be able to EMAC emergency management assistance compact, we'll be able to EMAC ham radio teams and have IMATs. I think that uh, Steve wants to say something about that. Well, um, yeah, they, this is the same old subject. And uh, think about, I mean, I have Dan Gardner and uh, JM and Dave Wilma here, uh, those people that uh, have both feet and arms and legs in the emergency management uh, community on a local level. This is on a local level. Um, when you have two competing groups and it doesn't matter what they are or what the subject is, when you have two competing groups and you've got a public servant and you're asking that public servant to exclude the other group and include your group or just include your group, um, they can't do that. They can't irritate one segment of their community to please another in that way. So what happens? They walk away. And uh, it takes a, a lot of finesse to get them back. Um, and the way I found that to be successful, regardless of what the scenario is, when you have that type of competition, is to request that the authority having jurisdiction or the critical infrastructure non-government organization Request that they form or that you assist them in forming their own reserve and take those people who have skill sets rather than orange badges, or if they have skill sets, we'll ask them to leave their orange badges at the, at the door or whatever they wear and dress professionally and come in there and um, uh, bring in their skill sets and uh, perform as a group as a local reserve directly managed by the agency. If I was an agency manager and I had 15 employees and I had a third party managing them, how long would I be there? So these people need to be directly managed um, and, and not commanding anybody in any way, but be a functional unit and do, what the, do what's required. And after their trust is built up, as JM was saying, after the trust is built up, they may find that it's a whole lot easier to ask the volunteers to keep the cash radio batteries charged, keep the uh, diesel additive in the diesel tower generator because it's never used or seldom used. Um, 
to uh, program some of the radios if you don't have union issues, uh, et cetera. It's not all about big emergency and, uh, you know, handling uh, emergency traffic. It's assisting that agency and that ESF2, that communication manager, uh, so that uh, it, everything runs more smoothly because there's a lot of things that he could do that you could do for him so that he can do things that volunteers like us can't do. So I'd like to hear from Dan Gardner or Dave Wilma or JM about uh, that perception. Okay, this is, uh, Don, you wanna jump in here on this? Gardner? Well, um, Steve, you said a lot of good things. And one of the issues that we always have is attitude just pure and simple attitude. Uh, coming into an emergency management office, into an EOC, that trust needs to be built long before you ever enter there. Um, we have a lot of requirements to meet with our federal grant funds. Some of that is exercises. And there again, our success, helping them do an exercise, and every exercise should have communication tied into it because guess what the number one failure in most exercises are? Communications. And then when you talk about uh, task books and such, unfortunately, I am the commu chairman for the state. And we have a lot of people that have taken OxCom, that have taken COML, COMT, and they don't finish their task book. Uh, you've got to take initiative, contact the commu. And if you're in my state, contact me let's get you into some actual exercises to meet those requirements of a task book. In other words, what I'm saying is we're going to build a dream team of amateur radio operators. Those that really want to do something, those are the ones that will make this happen and their example will set the path. That's exactly right. It, it happens that I'm the chair of the commune here in Arkansas. And I believe that uh, what you said is absolutely right. I'd like to address a, uh, in the chat, Jim N six M E D. Uh, at uh, you may not have been here at the at the front, uh, uh, Jim. But what I said was that the AHJs and uh, any other agency. I was just going to say AHJ instead of NGO and AHJ, just shortening it all up. This applies to every situation. Doesn't matter what it is. The operators have to satisfy the requirements of that particular group that they're working for, that agency. Who's next? Okay. Um, by the way, thanks. I appreciate you jumping in there. Uh, Stan, go ahead and take it there, sir. Oh, good evening, everybody. Stan, K9STN from Wisconsin Aries, East Central Region. And uh, something here I'd like to bring up is start with small things with your county if you're starting up a group and make sure you continue to do those small things for your county or your city. Uh, we started out, we had a new emergency manager, and we helped out with the testing of the sirens. When the sirens, their sirens are shut off during the winter here due to freezing conditions. So the first few times they're fired up, we go out and observe them, make sure they spin if they are a turning siren, make sure they sound fully, and we reported the bad sirens. And the new emergency manager was very impressed. And then we stepped up. We, of course, we're doing storm spotting before that. We volunteered for damage assessment. We started picking up on that, and now throughout the state, more and more counties are getting on a survey one, two, three damage assessment, which has been uh, very welcome. So that's helping expand our areas group here in general. So like I say, start with the small things. Uh, we talk, keep talking about the big one, but if you're willing to do the little things, they'll, they'll appreciate that and move into the bigger things as you go on. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. JN? I agree with you. <laughs> I don't know why you know, I don't have any conflict with that. <laughs> you got two people with their hands up that I can see. Okay, let's uh but let's uh Barry, how are we doing in the text world there? We're good. Okay. Tom, you wanted to take it away? W three T H D K yeah. Rat pack. You're on. I'm here. A um, couple of things I wanted to raise that uh, local groups might find helpful. Um, and somebody may be able to give me a, a cure for one of them. But the Joint Committee on Hospital Accreditation, which is just called the Joint Committee anymore, I don't 
you know, I don't track why they changed their name. Uh, they require that hospitals have backup means of communications. And one of the most common injects over the last 12 years, I've seen them impose on hospitals, which have to go through an accreditation exercise every three years without fail, uh, is they'll sweep their communications out from under them. They'll say, nope, can't use that, that failed. And the number of blank looks that, uh, you know, the the uh, exercise um, coaches, the exercise evaluators, referees, get on that one is just incredible. One of the things we've done is go to hospitals in advance and say, you know, we don't need much to help you out with that. And for us to be right there and satisfy them on that requirement. We just need to be able to place an antenna in advance and a coax in advance, and that's it. We're home free. Oh, and by the way, you know, the the commercial company that sold that hugely expensive system to this hospital got over on them. All you need to fulfill this requirement is this. Don't let any of the other companies try and sell you that. We'll bring our own. Uh, and then you don't have to pay a mountain of money to a professional radio shop to install whatever has the best profit margin for them. They were very grateful. Now, the counterpoint, I've got a club president who is working hard to go around me directly to the emergency manager to try and get the requirements trashed for the county auxiliary communications service. She doesn't like the fact that the board of the auxiliary communication service that I serve on uh, said, uh, we're going to go with what they've told us and we're not going to let you corrupt what they told us. If you're not willing to train, we can't use you. Somebody already said it was that simple, but it doesn't turn out to be that simple when somebody's influential in the ro local radio community and accuses you of being dictatorial and, and all that nifty stuff. And as I'm sure, J.M., a lot of people, you know, that sort of quarreling is very destructive. But I have no way of knowing how to bring this particular person to heal, if you'll forgive the phrase, um, and and get her to knock it off. Um, she's just determined that we're being extremist and they don't need this. And you could find a way to use them if you wanted to. And I said, look. These are the requirements. We didn't make them. We're not in a pay level where they get made or approved. We cannot change them. She won't accept that, and she's on the warpath. And I'm sure you know, Steve can tell you in, in deep levels how destructive that sort of thing is when your emergency manager is being exposed to that sort of yuck. So if anybody has some great ideas, I'd love to hear them. So what we did in Arkansas, I can speak to that. Uh, we waited for the son of a bitch to die. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it took uh, took us about 12 years. Uh, he was the section manager here in Arkansas. And when he died, that's when I have uh, been starting to revitalize the thing. Uh, the, our emergency management MCOM program in Arkansas died altogether. Uh, and it was a, it was a point that that you either have to make them give them another interest or in some fashion uh, just do away with their influence, however how it is that you need to do that. And I, that I'm at the point that I, I thought for a while that what we would do is, is, is wait, but I'm no longer a, a big fan of waiting because I'm getting old uh, and, and I think that I've got things that I want to see accomplished before I die. And one of them is that I would like to make sure that uh, when I uh, am no longer doing this job, that whoever inherits, inherits it from me gets something that is viable and works. And therefore, if I see somebody that is not in uh, a line with what is uh, modern and what will work and what is necessary, then we do our best to get shed of them. Never what it is that we've got to do. 
So that's 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 my advice. I hope that that's a harsh way to go about it, and I don't know any other way to, to say anything. To tell you the God's honest truth. Now, um, good God, um, my uh, my friend Bobby King sent me a text that says he does not know how to raise his hand. But he's pretty smart otherwise. And I wonder if we could slip him in to give up. Let him talk about it. Okay, Bobby, go ahead. Okay, I think I got myself unmuted. Um, just a comment on the uh, part of the training issue and the familiarization with the operators in the area uh, and M the EMA getting to know them. Um, I'm the president of the local club. Uh, I'm also the deputy director for emergency management in uh, my county. Uh, I sit on some of the commit same committees for the state uh, with JM and I'm a COMEL. But one of the things that we do every year to help pr promote and um, keep the hams familiar with the uh, EMA and the EMA folks familiar with our operators is for field day. We utilize the county's uh, MCOM mobile command trailer. It's a 40 foot self-contained 12.5 kW generator on it. We pull it out to the front parking lot and part of our setup uh, in that trailer is amateur radio is in the is in the front end in the comms room and there's one also in the back end in the uh, command post area. Um, but we bring in also our own equipment. But the amateur radio operators with our club that and surrounding area that come to help us for field day, I pull the trailer out and it's their job to set it up. They they help put up the uh, inflatable uh, forty foot. Uh, mast that has our uh, dipoles hanging off of it. Uh, they help run all the coaxes. They help get the generator going, get everything set up in that. And then we operate out of that trailer. So they are familiar um, on a regular basis with something, one of the tools that they may uh, get to or have to utilize um, to do emergency communications. We also have a walkthrough in the EOC and show them the equipment and the capabilities that's in the EOC. Uh, but this is a this is a yearly thing. This is our field day, and um, it just keeps them familiar. And we talk regularly at the club meetings. Uh, we have guest speakers come in. Uh, we have uh, you know just some of our our regular um, agenda talks about MCOM, talks about getting the classes, talks about um, you know if you're going if you want to do this and you're serious about it get uh you know go through the classes and get them and uh we keep a pretty good regular um uh, membership and so they're all familiar with us we're familiar with them and i have really no one that's on our club roster that i can't call at a moment's notice to come and help set up or operate if we need it to, need it to be and um, our county officials trust them just like they trust me. So, it, you know, again, that's just one of the tools we use locally to keep them involved with MCOM and us familiar with them. Well, well thank you. Appreciate those comments. Uh, JM? Well, Bobby's, um, Bobby's one of my longest lasting friends. Uh, we went to EMT school together uh back in uh 1979 is that i think that's right and uh so i've known bobby a long time and uh he's the president of the club that i'm the secretary of so i think that he is uh exactly correct we've uh both of us have been involved in emergency management since 1981 i think so we it's a long time I might uh, I might throw a comment in here real quick on my side. I here move my hand up. Okay, Dan, take it. Okay, hi there. Um, where I'm sitting in my chair, uh, it's a value system here in Idaho. We don't have a lot of 
big disasters. We have forest fires. We have um, some kinds of river will flood, uh, spring runoffs, and this kind of stuff. Pretty well local stuff. And uh, uh, a lot of these, uh, we have the problem both with the HAMS as well as with the emergency managers. And it's a value thing. Emergency managers, they don't have, you know, we're not worried about this because it's not that big of a deal. We'll handle it with what we got. The amateurs, uh, they're not being, you know, they're, they're, it, it's just a, a value type of a thing. And one of the things I would like to see is more um, uh, from top to down um, organization. In other words, from the regional level, have some regional level disaster training. And I, I know they do, but get these uh, states that don't have the disasters that others do. Our neighbors do, Oregon and Washington. They both have previous size disasters. Train with them, uh, widen out the scale, make it a more meaningful thing and make sure that the at the, uh, the county, uh, uh, at the county level, at the hospital level, they're part of that. That's just my two cents worth. And let's go we'll pick on David. David, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Dan. How's my signal? You sound great. All right, thanks. This is Dave Wella, Seattle Office of Emergency Management, uh, KG7LEA. And I, uh, I have a question, and I'll set it up first, is that I talk to a lot of hams who have actually uh, been through real activations things like Hurricane Ian and uh, uh, wildfires, uh, urban uh, uh, fires. And one complaint that comes up all the time is uh, they will have a, a stable of, of volunteers. They may have even been trained. They're carrying uh, 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 you know, credentials from, uh, from their emergency manager. And when the balloon goes up, it's crickets. They have a terrible time finding people to show up. And the whole show up factor is a serious problem. And it has occurred in many, uh, in all of the uh, uh, situations that I've uh, looked into, uh, looking for lessons to, to share here. So the question I have is what planning is done and what preparations are done to try to leverage uh, the existing uh, stable of uh, trained volunteers uh, with um, uh, perhaps unlicensed, license, you know, uncertified licensees, uh, people who are not licensed. Uh, one idea I had is for uh, hams to come up with like a sidekick, someone that can do their logging for them, that can drive the car, that can take care of the radio while they're down the hall, uh, things like that. And I'm curious as to what sort of planning uh, is being done in that regard. Thank you. Well, one of the I'd like to speak to that a little bit. We we're doing our very best to um, to tell people that if you're volunteering and, and we're counting on you, then we really would like for you to show up. And, and so one of the things that I do at the state level with uh, the guys that uh, man my stations are that we uh, have a, a roster and we schedule them that may Something may happen, something may not. But, uh, for instance, if something goes up and we need a quick response to the state level, uh, uh, EOC, right now, it's, his name is uh, Josh Carroll. He's on call. And so next week it'll be uh, Joel Eccles. Uh, the week after that, it's um, Mike, Nett Mike Nettles is in charge. He's the overall guy, but he's the guy that will do that. And so that's – that's our thing is that we actually schedule these things. Uh, and I, I bet that you're familiar with the Forest Service having red team and blue team, uh, IMTs. And those guys uh, were on call for that time period. And uh, then they were not on call for the next time period unless something terrible happened. That there was a second incident. And so that's the, that's the model that I'm using is, is that. Okay. Who's next? Anybody else got a comment about that? If it's not yeah, out of line, JM. Yes, sir. So I got a comment about that. If it's not out of line on a local level, how many of these uh, agencies have required or requested that teams of people be pre-assigned and build relationships where population is congested uh, during an emergency, like shelters? Uh, you know, a church has a shelter, a school system is a shelter, a corporation is a shelter, a convention center is a shelter, and build relations, have, have a 
not just one individual, but a team of people in case somebody can't make it. Uh, uh, come go to each one of these shelter sites or proposed shelter sites or listed shelter sites and build a relationship with the people that are there so that when something happens, they're pre-assigned. They just jump in there, whatever it is, and go to these shelter sites. And they're there because uh, uh, they're offering a resilient communication system through their two meter or whatever they're using to, to get back to the EMA or whatever it is they're trying to get back to. Um, those types of things, uh, providing redundancy uh, helps a lot. If uh, it's it's back to the competitive thing again. If if I have a buddy and uh, my buddy and I are um, going to do whatever it is that the EMA asks us to do, when they ask us to do it, uh, we're going to support each other as well as the EMA, and then it becomes personal. People have a, a greater tendency to show up in those kind of circumstances. Thank you. Okay, I might jump here from now on. Please, everybody, if you go, if we're going to speak, if you have a camera, please turn it on. It helps for the YouTube video afterwards and so forth. So be sure your video, your camera is turned on when you're speaking. Now, go ahead, J.M. Well, Steve's right. I mean, that's the idea. Whatever works for the particular either AHJ or NGO, whatever it is that you need uh, to fulfill their requirements, that's what you should try to accomplish. And if you have a hard time with whatever the, figuring out whatever their requirements are, what to do about it, there's people that can help. Uh, I mean, there's there's guy. I've got 40 years worth of experience with em, with emergency management. So does Bobby King. So does Steve Waterman. We can. There's people here that can help. And don't flounder around. There's folks that can help. So uh, back to you. Okay. Good, uh, good. In my view of it, uh, in almost any disaster, you got two types of hams. Those that are trained and they know about the, what they're doing and they're going to go about it. The agencies know about them and they put them right to work and everybody's happy. And you got the guys that show up with their handy dandy handheld or whatever, and they're they're insisting that they are qualified to do something, and they are. Uh, go have them stand by the tree and tell us when it falls or whatever the keys might be. Uh, there's a place for everybody, but you want to be meaningful volunteer part of the organization that's doing something uh getting involved with those agencies and uh training with them is the best way to go uh that's my another one of my two senses going on. i got a stack of pennies here okay don uh, doug go ahead i make a comment oh go ahead again we all have a focus on this which is good but we have to understand for example if a category five hurricane comes up the gulf and devastates arkansas you might have had 10 people that you had on your team. Probably eight of them are going to be unavailable to go to an assignment because they're going to be worried about their property or their lives or survival. When we had Matthew, it was going to come up into Palm Beach County, and the governor got on the media and said, if you do not evacuate, you will die. All of my hams disappeared because they were evacuating, and they got stuck on I-10 and in the traffic jam. So we have to deal with that. We have to be able to get in people from out of your area to uh, help us. And that's part of we're having standardized curriculum and standardized training and everything comes into effect. We need to plan for that. And we're not. A lot of emergency management agencies, too. You know, we have you know, 30 people that go into the EOC. If they're lucky, maybe 10 would be able to report to the EOC in a disaster because the roads will be damaged, the trees, the power will be out. They won't be able to get through roadblocks or stuff like that. We need to build that kind of thing into our exercises and into our plans. Back to you, Jam. Well, I agree. I thought I have no argument. Um, I might throw something out here real quick, and then I'll take a couple more callers. Rat Pack is serious about doing something for. Uh, emergency communications. Uh, JM has stepped up and ha and gave a, a agenda what he wanted to do. It just leaped all over the place. Exactly what we needed to do. We've got Steve out there. We've got a bunch of people that are very serious about uh, uh, disaster communications on our Rat Pack uh, planning board. What we want to hear from is you guys. Uh, the we need to know what you want, how we can help you guys out to do what you are needing us to do. So whether you're a ham, your emergency manager, both, whatever it is, 
get in touch with us. Tell us what you'd like to, like to have us work on to help you out. And we'll go that direction. This is what it's all about. With that in mind, Doug, take it away. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little bit of a case history. Go back just before COVID. Uh, and I started trying to rebuild the um, capability here in the county, uh, both from a uh, area standpoint, supporting the EOC and the shelters and everything else. And we had, it had pretty much fallen apart. The county didn't want anybody around. Um, a lot of uh, ill will here and there, so it, that took a little work. So I will tell people, if you want to get out and you want to uh, try to build some credibility, the first thing you got to do is go start taking some ICS courses, whether you take them locally with EOC or you travel for them and, you, and build a network and build some credibility that you're actually serious about making something happen. So that was that was the first thing. We got, um, got moving, got uh, just prior to COVID, had one meeting with the county and uh, they pulled their IT guys in and the uh, county comm guys. And when we finished, we're walking out and talking and the one guy that's been here yeah, 20, 25 years as an ES, ESF2 comm L in the county, he looked at me and he said, you know, the reason you guys got thrown out of here before is everybody thought it was a club and we were here to support them. So that's the attitude you, you've got to overcome some. Now here, and I'm coastal Florida, uh, West Coast, Daytona area. Our shelters are, are managed by the health department and coordinated through the county emergency management and the school board gets a vote. So you got three cats that don't like each other. That you kind of put them in a bag and shake them. And that's what we come out for shelter management. Now, this is the first year out of the last four that they've actually invited us to go on a shelter surveys. So I had uh, two teams of guys. We went out and went on a couple of shelter surveys. The goal here for the health department is to have us support medical care shelters. So all of them have good, solid emergency generators and backup power. Uh, they've got facilities that they can use. So, so what they're looking for, all of them should have permanently mounted antennas on the building. Of the, of the six that we looked at, one of them had no antenna. Two of them had marginal antennas that the SWR was close. I had one that had a really good SWR, but there was no connector on the antenna cable. Um, and a couple of them, we had to search for it and uh, that sort of thing. So I've been told and put together a list. They're going to going to rebuild some of that. In addition, what they did is the county came up uh, and asked me to go ahead and put together a list of stuff for shelters. And we're building, we built seven shelter radio kits. Okay, why does this thing, why is this important to you? Well, we use VHF, UHF. A technician can do that, and he can operate that radio with a little bit of training. But most of your technicians, especially the newer ones, are using a Baofeng. They haven't spent a lot of money on equipment, so you can't give them. An, most of them don't have an FDM 300 to take to the shelter. Uh, they can't do Winlink on their own FM radios, a lot of that. So we're building the capability to be able to incorporate some of the lower level licensees, if you will. Um, now, I carried this thing along for a couple of three years, got this going. And by the way, I'm also a COMEL and OXCOM and an instructor. Um, so that credit, that's the kind of credibility that it takes in some of those circles to, to try to get your foot in the door. And even after a couple of years, I'm still trying to get my foot in the door certain parts of the Old Boy Network. So, um, but that said, Take the, like I said, take the ICS courses, build some credibility. Locally, the uh, merchant manager wanted 100, 200, 700, 800. That's what he was looking for, for people to support the merchant management group. Um, state, state level is Oxcom. And, and I tell the guys, you know, Oxcom is a great course. You learn something, take the courses for it, take some more afterwards. But don't, uh, don't think that because you've got Oxcom, it makes you a hero. No, but what it does is get you the first step if you want to play outside the local level to go get a task book signed off. And it takes work to get those task books signed off in some places. In my case, three years in two states, back and forth, the whole lot of stuff I did on my own. So uh, it's getting better, at least within Florida. Um, Barry Bart briefly mentioned local uh, evacuations. Yeah, if we get a hurricane, we get a, a week's notice, a week plus. And it's in our area, and you get a 
you get a very nice ramp up, if nothing else, knowing this thing's coming and gradually the news stations around here quit showing anything but this hurricane, it's still two days out. Um, but what that does is people know they have to evacuate. You get barrier islands, you get beachside, those guys have got to move. You get certain areas designated in the county as automatic evacuation areas, depending on the severity. So my preaching point has been, if you're in one of those areas, do you want to go to the shelter as a refugee? Do you want to go to the shelter as part of the management team? Or do you plan to leave the area and try to find a hotel because I-95 is 10 miles an hour north forever and ever? Uh, so that helps a little bit and try to get to uh, identify the guys. We're down to possibly seven, uh, and the county would love to bring this down to two to four in critical need shelters. And that's all they're asking us to support. Finding uh, seven, eight guys to do that, it's still hard. And uh, my wife has her very own ideas of where I'm going to be should we get hit with a hurricane. So um, it's just uh, that's the way it is. And we deal with it. and We do the best we can. You can't go back too far in the state looking for help because the guys to the north of us that we do a lot of exercises with are in the same boat we are. We've got a couple of inland counties that we're, you know, co we cooperate with. But nobody has a mutual aid capability for amateur radios that anybody's willing to support. You know, your background checks don't transfer county to county. Uh, some guys have got badges. Some of us don't. Uh, it's all a, it's a crapshoot at the local level. Now, Aries and uh, ARRL and everybody else wants to shake hands and play nice at the uh, safe, calm and CISA level. That's great. <laughs> but that's going to have very little effect at the local level. Uh, it's personalities, attitude, training, and network, and being willing to show up and do something. And the folks that aren't willing to go that route, they're out. Uh, I got dinged very badly about a year ago. Emergency manager said, hey, time out, dress standards. You guys are in the building. How about having a little bit of a, you know, business casual type dress? That works. I mean, you know, everybody else has got to dress decently. And we had guys in flip-flops showing up in T-shirts and shorts. This is Florida. It's kind of like Hawaii. Um, so word went out. Two days later, one of my better guys walks into the uh, EOC, T-shirt, shorts, sandals, going in to check an antenna connection or something. Coming back out, uh, you know, they kind of looked at him, but nobody said anything. I got a email shortly after that and said, hey, I had this surfer dude walking down the hall this afternoon. Is he one of yours? Uh, I don't know. What do he look like? Here's a picture off a security system. And so I said, yep, he's one of mine. So I sent him a note and I said, Phil, ain't going to happen again. You know, you're going to have to play cards. Well, somebody should have said something. He said, he said, why don't you have my back? I said, I've got your back. You were told very specifically and you got very vocal after you were told the first time about you were a volunteer and didn't need to dress. I said, you just proved it. So you've just walked yourself out of the building. And, uh, you know, not much you can do about it, but you got to, you got to kind of hold the line somewhere. Um, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. I backed out of the EC for the County and handed that to some other guys. Cause you can't have it one deep. And, you know, I'm a supporting actor at this point and try to help them, uh, take it to the next level. So that's my two cents. It's a, um, a work in progress, you know, it's attitude. And we still get guys. I walked into a meeting the other day and it wasn't mine, but big double A, a double RL vest, all the badges, patches, and everything else. And, uh, you know, okay, aren't you in an Oxcom group? But I, did, I didn't say anything. But, uh, you know, if you're walking in somewhere, take a look in the mirror before you go. What kind of image are you going to present? And, and ask your folks what kind of image they present when they show up. All right. I've said enough. Dan, thank you for the microphone. And uh, good seeing everybody tonight. Uh, again, there's another guy here pre preaching to the choir, Dan. Uh, that's exactly right. He's correct. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I would like to talk about uh, that he <clears throat> was talking about the safe calm level and, and, and playing nice. I, I see that as a, um, um, more of a telling the AWRL members that the AWRL is 
trying to be serious about MCOM at this point, and hopefully that will translate down to the local level. I'm, I, you know, I don't know. I can't affect um, your county there in, in Montana. I can't affect the county in Florida to be more professional and, and to be trained and all that stuff. But if we start at the – I do have the ability to affect what happens at SAFECOM. And that's where that training begins. And, and that's, uh, that's the best we can do. That's the best I know how to do. If there's somebody that's got a better idea, I sure would like to hear it. So I'm on your side, Doug. Uh, Doug, I'd like to throw it here real quick. I'd like to make you an offer here tonight. Would you like to come on and give a presentation? You have experience. You're right there with some good ideas. Uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to present here on Rat Pack. Uh, to get some of that out. Would you be interested in doing something like that, Doug? First thing I should do then is mute my video and let go away, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about offline. I've got to find a time frame that'll work for you and give me a chance to do something that's actually worth saying and not uh, just rambling. All right, that's fair. And I'd like to extend that out to other people that have meaningful content that comes from education, from an educated, uh, uh, you know, educated experiences of what the, what we need and what, what we can do to improve ourselves. So get a hold of me, K7RDX at ARL.net will work. And um, we'll uh, get you in there working in the schedule. We need to get you kind of folks out there. We need to, we're going to make a dent in this thing and make it what we intend to make it. We need everybody involved we can. So with all that, my pennies are starting to run out here. Tom, go ahead. Thank you, sir. The uh, I forgot some things uh, before that I wanted to. Uh, um, a, a television thing that happened to us accidentally that I wanted to share was that uh, we were filming a local event with the old NTSC cameras, amateur radio cameras. Uh, and it was for the simplest thing you can imagine. We were just uh, allowing the people at the bandstand to see the units coming down the street. That's all. They asked for it. We provided it. But then a uh, CSX train decided to have a wheel on one of their cars. Yeah, one of those cars with a shield at each end and the red diamond on each side and on the ends. And the wheel <laughs> left the tracks. Now, it wasn't what... I would call a derailment, but the fact is that the EC went bananas, and what we did was we sent our signal on one of the standard cable TV standards, and our guy at the EC went in there, got permission, and took the outdoor antenna and put it on the cable input instead of on the outdoor antenna input, tuned the cable, and there was our picture, and the EC was ecstatic. And that's because the cable um, companies are very tight-fisted and they were determined that they were not going to convert all their equipment to the new standard. So all the manufacturers that sell in the United States have to have an NTSC receiver on the cable side. And it doesn't take much imagination at all to change the antenna connector, throw it to the correct channel, and your amateur radio television uh, uh, video will be there for them to see. Just for something to know. Uh, shelter sites, they are fanatical here about not letting anybody say that any given location is a shelter site. It's a big concern they have. Um, so we have that as a challenge. I have gotten it through to our people that they are never to say this or that place is a shelter site. But the additional challenge with that is the plan is that the Red Cross manages mass care. And the Red Cross doesn't want to talk to anybody but their own amateur radio operators. Uh, and they don't want any other help, even though they clearly do not have enough operators to cover it when we've had exercises. So I don't know how to do that if somebody to help them out. And uh, the, other, the, the other thing was we were sent to a site for a flood. And they have a command team that they brought in from out of the area. And the command team tells 
man with five people. He wants us to travel 250 miles and go lump trucks, load and unload trucks, 250 additional miles. Um, and I had to look at him and say, you know, you're going to have to get the resource people to tell me to do that because I understand that you need trucks lumped, but I've checked in with them. They know we're here in holding and they may, may be expecting us to be here. That's how I dodged it. So I said, you're going to have to check with them. And luckily, whether for reasons of their own or because they were nice guys, they backed me up. You, you, you can't grab a typed team and send them to lump trucks. Stop that. But they could have as easily told us to lump trucks. And I would have been the only one coming back after subjecting those radio operators to 250 more miles of travel and lumping trucks. None of the rest would have ever come back again. I can guarantee to you that. Um, and somebody, uh, in fact, it was you, JM, you said, what can we do to support us? Can you do anything about the Frankenstein monster that the ARL calls an individual task book? Clue phones ringing. All task books are individual. And they call the person an emergency communicator. I did a little experiment. I asked the local head of the Salvation Army, the chapter manager for disasters at the Red Cross, and uh, one of our hospital liaisons, what would you expect an emergency communicator to be able to do for you? Not one of them brought up radio. One guy thought we should be able to fix his flooded telephone system because he'd been through one of those at Dallas before he'd moved up here to serve this hospital. Uh, the Red Cross uh, person said, uh, well, you should be able to restore our internet. Well, that's that's a nice thought, but totally impracticable. Um, you know, if, if the uh, commercial infrastructure has gone down heavily in your area, you can't restore their internet. So what I'm saying is, the, the way they've got that book structured, it may be a fine ego stroke for a bunch of people, but it's not useful. They call it uh, individual task book training plan and, and something else they threw in. They've got two job guides included in it, one for dispatch and, and uh, return and one for something else. That's why I'm calling it a Frankenstein monster. It's a monster made of the parts of several different bodies. Um, if you can talk to anybody at the uh, Newington, uh, you know, in the emergency management office and get them first to sit down and take FEMA's course on how you write a position task book, which isn't a very demanding course, but it would tell you that that book's wrong. And, you know, if I, if I had put that book in front of our emergency manager, they'd laugh me out of their office. I kept it hidden. You know, I'm using some of the items in it to check people off, but I would not dare call that thing an emergency task book. So that's one thing I really would appreciate help with. Get the get the Newington to reconsider that thing. And I'm I'm with you on that. And I think that's something that they are looking at. Uh, just happens that the new emergency manager for the ARRL was a student of mine. Uh, in COMEL, I taught him his COMEL class, and I think that that is something that he's familiar with. We've spoken about that before. He's uh, got more to do all at one time. He's got about 45 flapjacks in there. He's like he's working at the Waffle House, you know, and he's he's, he's got a side of bacon over there that's burning up all at the same time. I've, uh, we've got to have a lot of patience with him because he's got just absolutely more to do. He's got the same thoughts that we do. It's whether what he can get done because of the tremendous inertia in uh, corporate inertia that the has had since the 40s uh, on, on uh, providing the MCOM. Uh, he's got a lot to overcome. I believe that he can do it. And my, my thing is, is uh, that I want to help him to do it. And one of the ways, the only way that I know of to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And we have we as uh, local and, and uh, state level MCOM practitioners have to uh, be careful that we make sure that we give a consistent message 
to the amateur radio operators that this is what we have to see. If you want to participate, this is what you have to do. And uh, out of that will come those consistencies and training that will be, uh, while tailorable for a local level, because not everybody's got the same need. I mean, they do not need Skywarn necessarily in Montana like they do here in um, in Arkansas. I mean, we, we had uh, Skywarn running this, this uh, hailstorm yesterday was uh, 50 miles wide and 200 miles long. Uh, and uh, it, it did three and four inch hail uh, all that entire path. It went over into Mississippi and we kept, we, we don't keep track of it. Once it gets to Mississippi, we don't care about that. So the, the, the thing is, is that um, if we're able to perform on that level all the time, then the, the emergency managers are going to take note and say, hey, these guys are doing something good. Maybe we can utilize them in some fashion. And that's how we're going to build confidence and uh, all the talking that we're doing amongst ourselves here, when we talk to each other, we might give each other ideas and what have you, but the idea is, is that we need to be talking to our emergency managers and having a frank discussion and, and saying, is there something that I can do that would make you trust me? And if there is, let me do it right now. And if there's not, then you're going to have to move on, I'm afraid, until that guy dies. And that's <laughs> the the attrition is is where we've been successful here in Arkansas. And that's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Thank you for your comment, by the way. Dan. Or who's next, brother? Please. Go ahead, Barry. What'd you say? Can you let John uh, Jim N six M E D he wants to make a comment and then we can do uh Carolyn. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, just uh, a couple short comments, hopefully uh, regarding Red Cross. Um, may or may not be generally known that uh, I'm a member of that particular disaster relief uh, organization. And uh, as my local region disaster officer calls me, his comm guy. Um, that being said, it just kind of a... Um, General comment about the Red Cross, uh, it's horribly uneven across the country, uh, not unlike uh, areas across the country, I guess. Um, but the local attitudes toward amateur radio participation varies from um, a from CEOs and RDOs who are very pro. Um, backup communications, our communications, to those others who will say, never mind, we have our cell phones and uh, we'll call you when we need you, maybe. So just be really aware of that. And also from your uh, your comment, Tom, earlier uh, about Red Crossers uh, thinking, okay, you're going to be coming in and helping them with their IT stuff and so forth. Um, that's purely because of ignorance and Again, it's uneven across the country, but just uh, have some awareness of it. And, um, you know, times are changing. Uh, well, that's the only constant, I guess, is change. But the Red Cross has gone ever more heavily over to cell phones, and uh, which makes it a challenge over here in Northern California where the uh, terrain gets a little bit lumpy and challenging for Red Cross. But just kind of keep that in mind. What you hear about someone's experience in Texas may be radically different from someone else's experience in Ohio or Northern California. Um, that's it. N6 MED out. And so I want to say not only you know, uh, with the Red Cross, you're going to have different experiences every county every parish in the United States is different uh, as well. And so that's a, that's a point very well taken. Every one of those NGOs that are in those counties and parishes is different. And that's how come I say we have to find what the, the authority wants and then design a curriculum exercises and then uh, 
a curriculum again to find and satisfy the, those local agencies. All right. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I love for us to expand this out so that we have mercy managers on here too, people, non hams, that need hams to talk to us and uh, tell us what the, their views are. Don Gardner is a real good one, but we need more Don Gardners out there. Uh, Carolyn, you got your hand up and you're ready to go. Go ahead. Yeah, just one comment about appearances. Um, the organization that I associate with the Los Angeles Auxiliary Communication Service, we all wear uniforms and uh, we serve as the city, of course. But uh, any kind of deployment that we go on, we have to be in uniform. And that that kind of thing, if, if your organization has uniforms, would alleviate the problem of somebody walking around in flip-flops and shorts. So that, that's all I had to say. K6COB out. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Uh, Steve, you're, you, were you wanting to say something? Me? Yeah, you came on. Yeah, you're on, oh. you're on mic. No, oh, I don't know. I, I just, uh, I agree with what she said. Uh, um, you know, the, the, the Every uh, human beings want cheese when they go down a tunnel. They want cheese to be at the end and getting uniform and access and have, being associated as uh, an employee without pay, uh, perhaps getting some liability coverage or workers comp, um, getting a, a picnic uh, in, your, in your honor every once in a while. can doesn't cost an agency a lot of money, doesn't take a lot of time and makes a big difference. It solidifies uh, uh, the organization and makes it a cohesive, heterogeneous group of people um, and makes them feel like they're, the work they've been doing is uh, worth it. So I agree with uh, Carolyn um, 100%. I missed a lot of what was going on here. I had the phone call I had to take. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, I heard uh, a lot about Oxcom and a lot about Aries and a, what have you. Um, I think Oxcom is a great thing, but if I had a choice to go after I took my 100, 200, 700, and 800, I would seek ICS 300 and 400 classroom courses and uh, try my best to get in those courses and then go through the communication leadership, the COMEL course. Oxcom are not Going, it, that class is not going to be filled full of people that you may be working with in the agency, in your nearby agency, uh, like the COMEL class would be. So with ICS 300 and COMEL, you're team building with the very people that you're going to be working with. And they'll learn to trust you, know you, like you, or not like you, or whatever. But uh, you'll get that, uh, you'll get that uh, experience with people who are actually doing this for a living uh, while you're training with them and learning with them. And I think that's uh, extremely valuable, something that should be mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and there was a comment there uh, Don Gardner put into the chat there about, uh, well, Don, come on, tell us about it. Don? Yeah, uh, one thing is just recognition. And one thing I did do, uh, I like to write, articles and I wrote a very full page article and explained ham radio to the community rented in the newspaper it cost me very little and the comeback was enormous of appreciation and wanting to work together so some simple steps can really really pay off that's a great idea yes it is well we've gone over time it's been worth it it's been great we're going to be doing more of this stuff I'm going to, again, I'm going to invite people. you got something to offer. Tell us about it. We'll get to get, we'll put a plan around it. Dan, I'm going to let you be the last one here. Go ahead, Dan. To sum things up, everybody's pointing out that there's, there's a continuum of needs and something over 2,000 or 2,200 counties, and each of them is going to have different needs and uh, different ambience. Now, I come from an agency where I could get a lot more work done when I wasn't in uniform. So that's a particular bias I have, and I own it. Uh, and I tried really hard to make it through tonight without mentioning the NIMS ICT 
24 page guidance because it came up several times that emergency management lives on networking and all kinds of communications infrastructure. So it's not just radio that they need support for. <clears throat> and uh, eventually I think all the training and, and I haven't had Oxcom in eight years now, but even back then it was, well, it was pretty much totally radio focused. Um, but now a little bit of uh, know-how, uh, how to uh, piece together networks where, you know, the outage isn't ubiquitous or statewide or, you know, sec region wide, uh, that's going to become more and more valuable. And that's what the 24 page and I honestly forgot. It's a safe comm document. And I think it was, well, it's from NIMS. It's from the, uh, I think it's out of EMI. And I'm not sure if CISA or FEMA is behind it. But it's going to be a new branch in the ICS. And that is the one thing all emergency responses have in common in this country. And a little more emphasis on getting the 300 and or 400 beyond the 1, 2, 7, 800, 4 core is going to have huge payback. Uh, so however you can do it, you know, I salute everyone who has. And JR, you should require that everybody read that 24 page ICT, NIMS ICT branch. Yeah, I, I was on the committee that uh, was responsible for getting FEMA to change their mind about adding this, uh, the Oxcom uh, group, by the way. It only took us 13 years. And so this has been a labor of love of mine for a very, very long time. I believe that you are correct that uh, everybody ought to read that uh, guidance, especially the changes from uh, the, what was it, uh, 2013, whatever it was, I forget, uh, the, to see what the changes are, because I think that's real progress, especially naming us specifically. That means that the emergency managers recognize that we're viable. And so we can just go from there. And, and it might be that where there is internet, what they really want to see is, photos of how bad the flooding is or videos. Exactly. Yeah. And we shouldn't eschew being able to do that. We, we should make that, you know, just part and parcel of our toolkit. Right. Whatever situational awareness is a big deal and for the emergency, for any emergency manager. And I think if we provide that, that may be the very, that may be the stepping stone, the threshold for us to come in. So there you go. Okay, we're running into an hour and a half here, but I don't want to leave anybody out. Pete, you had your hand up? Yeah, I've uh, so far done the <clears throat> Oxcom and, and a Com T, um, and I may submit my thing for a RADO class that they're still looking for people for in a, at the end of the month. They're like, oh, I just went to a little show and tell presentation they did for you know, non, non radio people. And they're like, Oh, by the way, we have open seats sign up. So I may do that, but that's a, a good point about, you know, um, I, I, you know, people, the head of the New York state, uh, you know, um, office of interoperable and emergency compute communications says, hi, Pete, when I, you know, when I, uh, when I see him. So, that's good. But the one thing that uh, I think the, the Oxcom is great um, and, 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 uh, and all, but Oxcom, and, it's, and it was emphasized in the course, you may or may not be using a radio. So I think, um, you know, some, some, they're expecting you to be almost like a technical specialist and not, not a radio operator. And, um, I've I've kind of, you know, suggested to my uh, my guys, and they're all like, "Well, we don't have time for that, and we don't have, we can't take, you know, three days off during the week, and uh, uh, so on and so forth." So I think that Oxcom is a nice thing, but I don't think that is a ticket for the majority of of hams. I don't I don't think it's going to be. 
Okay, I want to comment on that, JM, and then uh, we'll check out the text and get on out of here. So my my reply, uh, Pete, is that uh, you're right. It's not a one size fits all thing, and those that some people will uh, want uh, their operators to to do it, and other ones don't care. And it uh, what we want to keep our eye on here is satisfying the requirements of either the uh, the AHJ or the NGO or whatever agency you're trying to serve, whatever they want. If you want to play, you've got to use their rules. That's just all there is to to it. So there you go. Back to you, Dan. Okay, Barry, what we got in chat? Yeah, up to date in chat. Okay, with that in mind, uh, uh, this has been a great meeting. There'll be more. Bobby, Bobby King has got his hand up. He never has figured out how to do that. Right okay, now. Bobby King, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm claiming ignorance. Uh, I just want to comment real quick on some of the comments that were made while ago in chat and uh, post and also online. Um, the comments about uh you know feed them clothe them give them badges whatever uh you know like that you know uh insurance stuff like that we've run into that in arkansas that's been one of the things that has been a hold up is people won't didn't they don't want to participate unless they're going to get something out of it from either the served agency or the state or someone else um part of that has been preached that you got to get credential. You got to have the classes. You got to go through the training and and all. And then that works you into being a trusted person by your AHJ or the state level, whoever. Uh, and at that point, then in Arkansas, if you are a credentialed person and your and your local government trusts you. At that point, the EM can put you on as an auxiliary communicator, a ham operator, a, a bulldoze operator, whatever, you know, and they can put you on as, as a volunteer, just like the volunteer fireman, and they can put you on the state's workman's comp or on the county's workman's comp if you meet all that criteria. And so uh, that that's kind of the trade-off. If you want to have all those luxuries and be afforded uh, those items, then you have to meet their standards. And so uh, that's that's how it's been handled at the at our local level and the state level. Is that if you if you can show us that you're interested enough to get credentialed at the standards set forth, then at that point, if you are brought up to active status, you're automatically covered by a, the county's workman's comp or state's workman's comp and uh, and afforded all those benefits. So that's just all I had to say. Well, thank you. Those are good comments there. Anybody else got anything to throw in there before we pull the plug? Hearing nothing, I guarantee you folks, we're going to have more of this. And if you have something to offer, like I uh, offered to Doug earlier, I hope that he'll come through with that. Um, I, we like to hear from you. We'd like to get that participation and take and take a look at uh, your experience, your knowledge, and get this all going. With that, I'm going to say 7301. It's been great. Have a great weekend coming up. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, JM.